Let me just uh, welcome all of you to this first, uh, first of our four sem monthly seminars we're going to have on art and the Christian faith. Uh, I think we're going to really enjoy them. Uh, and I just want to uh, uh, give you a little bit of background. Uh, I think each of you were provided an outline. In your last email, I sent you an outline of the presentation. If you have that uh, printout of it, it makes it easier to just follow and sometimes to take notes and things. And sometimes there's, there's names of some of the pictures in the outline and they may not be uh, on the screens, but certainly Josh will be talking about them. I think we've, we've talked, asked you all to mute your sound and I think all, everybody has, so we've got your sound muted. And at the end, uh, when Josh finishes, I'm gonna turn this over to Josh in a few minutes. So at the end, uh, you can unmute when you can ask questions and make comments. Uh, if, if, you, if you're unable to watch all of it, or if you find it, you want to share this with some friends, we'll be recording this seminar and early next week, we'll have it posted on the, the Worship Place website and we can do that. Um, let me just uh, introduce Perry, our pastor. Most of you know our associate pastor, Terry Goodnight. Can, Terry, you want to say a few words? Uh, sure. Well, first, uh, hello, Joshua. I know we hadn't had a chance to meet. Yeah, welcome. Uh, good to see you. Good finally to put a face to the name. Um, I want to thank Dan for, for pulling this together and, and uh, contacting uh, Joshua and, and uh, getting this um, Zoom meeting put together for us all. Um, when, he, when he suggested doing uh, seminars on Christian art, I thought it was a great idea. Um, Christian art is, uh, has been in the past very pivotal in, in uh, people's uh, devotional lives and, and lives of, uh, of those growing closer to God. Um, you know, like steeples on the church are meant to, to uh, cause the eye to gaze upward, and, and as the eye gazes upward, to, to also move the heart and mind in contemplation about about God and his kingdom. And that's what, um, uh, that's what the Christian art does as well. And so I think uh, Joshua will be getting into uh, much of that um, in this session and then the upcoming sessions. Um, and so I hope, uh, I hope you enjoy this and we'll learn from it. Um, and um, maybe even there'll be time at the end to ask some questions and grow even more. Um, so I'm going to open this in prayer and then uh, kick it back to Dan to introduce uh, Joshua to us all. Very good. Okay. Lord, we thank you for, for the gift of imagination, gift of creativity that you have given us to express our, our faith and our love for you in, in creative ways. And we pray that, uh, that we would be able to see uh, the devotion in the mind and the heart of the artists that have come before us uh, as, as they have learned from you and as they look into you, uh, that we would be able to see what they see and grow close to you in, in those ways as well. Uh, continue to lead us in the study and help us to see your hand through it all. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let me introduce our seminar leader, uh, Josh Simmons. Uh, Josh has got a great background for this and, <clears throat> and, and good experiences. Uh, his undergraduate work was in history and Christian thought, and then he attended uh, Westminster Theological Seminary and earned a master's in church history and did a good bit of study about Christian art during that time. He's currently, uh, his, his current role in, is, uh, is a, he is the associate head of the uh, uh, Regent Classical School in Austin. And that's, that's where my grandchildren attend. It's in Southwest Austin and it's a classical Christian school. And, and uh, he teaches courses there in ancient and classical history, modern European history, uh, American history and apologetics. And uh, during the uh, summer, he leads uh, the Regent students on summer tours uh, in, the, in Europe that include the Louvre and Westminster Abbey, uh, the National Gallery in London. And he does all these things and helps them to understand uh, the, the examples of a Christian art in their history. Uh, Josh is married, been married 18 years. His wife's name is Erin. They have three children, their names are Hannah, and Tobin and Sabine. Josh, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing this screen and then I'm gonna pass it over to you so that you can control it. Hold on just a minute now. Let's see, Josh.
Okay, I'm making you the host right now. Okay. Right. Wonderful. Yep. Well, I am uh, so thankful to be here uh, with you this afternoon. I thank you, Dan, for the uh, the opportunity to do this. Um, really excited about these four uh, classes. Like like Dan was saying, we um, take students every year to Europe to get them to kind of explore the cultural life of the Christian world, because um, so much of it is centered around uh, art and architecture. We'll have one um, lesson specifically on uh, cathedrals and church architecture, especially um, coming up. But I'm going to places, yeah, like the Louvre, like the Uffizi in Florence, just seeing the, the work of Christian artists, the ways in which they have taken uh, the Christian faith and made beautiful things out of it, I think is a very powerful thing, as Pastor Goodnight was saying. I think it has led to uh, conversions and to people deepening their faith because they see the beauty that's being made before them, and that calls them out of themselves to God. And beauty has a powerful uh, message in that regard. So um, today uh, we're going to be focusing on some kind of basic readings of Christian art. So things when you're looking at a piece of Christian art, like what are some things you should be looking for um, in terms of symbolism, in terms of colors, um, those types of things. The main thing we're going to be doing today. And then at the end, hopefully we're going to have a chance to look at some particular pieces and you can kind of test yourselves after what we've talked about to see if you can pick up on the uh, some of the imagery that's being presented in the uh, in the art. But before we get um, too far into that, I want to give kind of a little bit of a background or maybe a theology for why we should even be talking about art in the first place in the Christian worldview, because um, you know, we're probably all familiar with the second commandment. You know, if you think about the second commandment, it says, you should not make for yourself a carved image or a likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And you shall not bow down and you shall not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So the, the question I think we really need to just start with is, is Christian art even a licit thing to do? Is it moral to make Christian art, given the, the pretty explicit commandment God gives uh, the people of Israel here in the second commandment? And so I want to kind of start by kind of saying this is why I think Christian art is a valid, applicable thing, um, and the second commandment doesn't necessarily apply to it um, here to get us started, and then we'll jump into some, some other things. I think when we think about biblical art, um, there's a variety of ways we could look at it, but I think thinking about a, a kind of a spectrum between Aaron, and talking about Moses' brother here, and Bezalel, who is the craftsman God charges with making the tabernacle <laughs> covenants and that whole stuff back in uh, uh, following the Exodus as, as kind of paradigms for, for how we should think about art. So Aaron obviously did lots of amazing things, and Moses' brother being involved in the Exodus, but when we talk about Aaron and art specifically, you probably all have kind of an imagery or a story in the Bible that's come into your mind where Aaron used art probably not in the way it was meant to be used. Right? Of course, we're talking about the golden calves. Right When Moses has gone up on the mountain uh, to receive the Ten Commandments, to, to talk with God about how to lead the people, um, Aaron is down there with the people, and the people, as happened quite frequently on the <laughs> Exodus journey to the Promised Land, they get upset. They're upset that they've been brought out here to die in the wilderness with no food, and Aaron's not sure what to do about it. And so Aaron decides to take visual representations, these calves, and make them kind of the image that they can worship. He's using it as kind of a thing to unify the country of Israel around are these calves. He even says, you know, these calves, O, o Israel, are the ones that have led you out of the house of Egypt. All right? And so Moses then, of course, comes down with the Ten Commandments, which has the second commandment just written on it, like we just looked at, and sees, you know, the people of Israel offering up sacrifices, and, you know, they sacrificed gold to make these golden calves. And here we have, a, it was, you know, we call this idolatry, right? These are idols that are being made to substitute for the people's worship in, of God. Um, they're being put up in place of, to, to pull people away from worship to God. And so that, I think we could clearly say, is a good example 
of bad use of art. When art is being made to make it something that is distracting or pulling us away from God, then it's something that's clearly working against what it's made to do. Right, this is where sin is entering into the creative act, we might say. Bezalel, on the other hand, is charged by God to make the beautiful things and trappings and decorations that are around the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. And then also, of course, when Solomon builds the temple, we know it's filled with beautiful carvings and things and trees and angels and the cherubim on top of the Ark. There's all sorts of imagery involved there because in the temple, at the point of the art is to point to God, right? It's to pull them to God rather than drive them away from God. And so I think as we think through these art pieces and the ideas we're going to be looking at, I think that's maybe, I find that a helpful paradigm of thinking like, is this art something that's driving me away from God, causing me to change my vision or my structure from thinking about God and Christ onto something else? Or is it something that's making me more like Christ? It's, um, it's enlivening my spirit in a way that brings me towards God. And we'll be spending more time probably in the last talk on, um, on the last part of how we can use art in our devotional lives. Um, the other thing that I think is a big factor when it comes to thinking about art in Christianity is the incarnation of Christ. I think the incarnation changes everything. And we'll talk about why that is for a couple reasons here. First, as we know, right, in, in Christian theology, Jesus is fully God and fully man. He is the God-man, the, the logos of God in human flesh, takes on form uh, by the Virgin Mary. Um, this is really important to understand, because if he's fully man, this would mean if Jesus is walking along the streets of Galilee and somebody was drawing a picture on the side of the road, they could have drawn a picture of Jesus as God, right? He is God there. So if he's fully man, that means he should also be able to have an image or a portrait taken of him, just like all the rest of us can. if We've had portraits taken of us in time. And so I think in order to really do justice to the fully man part of the incarnation, I think we have to recognize that there's some aspect of change happening here when it comes to images of God being created. Um, that the, in the Old Testament, they, they didn't have an incarnate God, of course. And so it, it changes, I think, the situation for them. And the early Christians figured that out pretty quickly. Second, Jesus repeatedly blesses the physical things in this world. Right, one of the things that um, you know, the early Christians fought a lot with a group of people called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics believed that uh, the body, particularly physical things, weren't of any value. All that mattered was the soul. And the resurrection of the body that Jesus go, undertakes, his eating of fish after the resurrection, things like that are signs to us that the physical world really matters to God. Now, of course, this shouldn't be a surprise to us because God created the physical world and called it good back in Genesis. But this, I think, repeated blessing of the physical that Jesus does is a continuation of that, that beginning of things, that creative act that God began and saying this is good that it's corrupted by the fall, and then Christ is showing us how we can use physical things to get back to the way things should be, get back to the way things are meant to be, not how they are. So to think about some examples of ways that Jesus kind of uses the physical world to accomplish spiritual kind of ends or goals, you know, we have the, um, obviously the Lord's Supper is a great example of this. We have physical bread, physical wine or juice, right? coming together in a spiritual sense. Um, he uses mud at different times to heal the sights of blind people. Um, with the, uh, the man who's lowered down through the roof by his friends, he heals his body first and then forgives him of his sins. Right? He starts with the physical and then moves to the, uh, the spiritual there. There's a sense of like, get up and walk and your sins are forgiven. Right? Um, he turns water to wine at a wedding. Right? It's hard to think of a more kind of physical incarnate act than that wine and water thing at the wedding and the blessing of the wedding itself. So these are all things and ways which I think Christ is telling us that the natural world, the physical world, the material world that's around us is meant to be used by us. But we can use it good or bad, just like we can use our bodies for good or bad. We can use all sorts of things to do good or bad in this world. We should be using it for good, and he kind of sets us up for that. Third, 
you know, we are made in the image of God, we're told in, in Genesis. And so when we think about what that means, as, as Christians have reflected on that over the centuries, one of the key attributes of God that we see is his creativity. You know, we see this in nature, in all the varieties of things. We see in the variety of people, the variety of trees, the variety of dogs. There's this, this creative impulse that God has that's part of his nature. And Tolkien, uh, the great author of uh, The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, he used to call this that what we are is we're sub-creators. We don't create ex nihilo, which is the theolo theological term for out of nothing. We don't create that way. Only God can do that. But we can take things that God has made and create out of them. You know, God made the rock that Michelangelo turned into the David, right? The David was not there until Michelangelo took his creative impulse and he brought forth the David out of that. And so um, Tolkien, I think this idea of sub-creators that he uses when he thinks about creating the mythology of Middle Earth is very similar to how I think a lot of artists think that we're taking the gifts that God has been given to us, which requires a lot of knowledge. We have to know, um, if I'm dealing with paint, I have to know the, the way in which the colors interact with one another. I have to know in way in which the brush, uh, how is it going to change color to color? How do I need to wash the brush, make sure I don't get colors bleeding over? There's a lot of things about the physical world I have to know to successfully bring out my creative impulse, but I can use the gifts that God has given to me in terms of my mind, my physical talents, my ability, my vision for something, and I can create something in a similar sense to how God created at the beginning. Yeah, not in any way like God, because he's doing an amazing work beyond anything we can imagine and bring you know, something out of nothing. But we can bring something out of a different something, or we can bring a beautiful something out of an ugly something. And that is still a gift of God that we have and I think should be using. And finally, um, Jesus, you know, throughout his ministry, he is about making things new. We see this in the way he heals people. Um, you know, he's not satisfied with the fact that, like, oh, this person, you know, that they're, well, they might be in heaven and they'll be healed then. He brings healing to the blind. He lets the lame walk. He does all of these things to, to bring about the new creation. He's restoring things. We see in Revelation, right, the end of those things, everything kind of coming together at the end. But if Jesus is making all things new, art should be part of that. We shouldn't just give art to the ungodly to let them do art as they want to do. So Jesus is about making all things new, and art is part of that. And Christians throughout the centuries have recognized that they can do a lot with the artistic gifts that they've given them to make the world around them a beautiful place, fill it with spiritual uh, significance, to point them in their daily life to God, so to, to stop them from being distracted by the world and help the world be more beautiful than it was before they, they arrived on the scene and to point them and others to Christ. And that's ultimately the goal that Christian art should be working towards and trying to do. Okay, so when we think about then art within the Christian worldview, we have kind of framed some kind of different ways of thinking about this. But at the same time, um, Christians have not always had the same view about art. There have been different understandings of how art should be used or should not be used over time. Um, when I lived in Philadelphia, I was part of a, uh, a church denomination that um, took the Second Commandment very, very seriously, and they did not have any representations of art in any, particularly of Jesus or anything like that, in any of their church buildings or even anything that the church published, because they really centered on that, um, on the second commandment as saying this is a really valuable um, and vital thing. And I think we think about, you know, our Catholic and Orthodox brothers and sisters, art is everywhere in their churches, and they spend a lot of time on that. So there's, a, there's certainly a spectrum in Christian history when it comes to art and how Christians have viewed it. So um, the oldest way maybe of distinguishing art in the Christian worldview is making a distinction between what's called dulia and latria. Dulia and latria. Um, this is a uh, distinction that's typically today found primarily in the Roman Catholic Church, but the, uh, the Orthodox certainly have a similar understanding to this, and it goes back a long time. But 
they describe a difference using these two different Latin words. Both words mean something along the lines of worship or reverence, but they distinguish between two types of reverence. Dulia refers to reverence that um, is appropriate to men or other humans. So I might have dulia for my president or for my king or something like that. There's an appropriate amount of reverence that should be there. And so then Christians over time began to think about that and say, well, okay, that makes sense that we do have respect for people in authority, right? Scripture tells us that. But what about those who have been gone before us in the faith, those you know, that have been called saints who have set examples for us in the faith? Shouldn't we show a certain amount of respect for them, not just the people, you know, God has put in charge of us, but people who have lived holy lives, who have, who have, who have made a path um, of kind of that we can follow to become more like Christ, shouldn't we show them reverence? And so the term dulia typically gets used to refer to how Christians can, can reverence saints, whether we're talking about could be uh, Mary, could be John the Baptist, or any of the saints, but without confusing it with the worship of God. It's reverence in the same sense of this is the appropriate thing to do because this is a holy person, and, and in a, the presence of a holy person, we should show respect. Latria, on the other hand, is the worship that's due to God alone. Right? We have to keep those two things distinct. We should never worship a saint the way in which we worship God. And we see this in a um, place that I think we see this very clearly is in... Um, uh, revelation when frequently an angel will show up to john and john will fall down and worship and the angel has to be like hey, get up get up i'm not god don't worship me i'm just a creature like you and so that's a, the drawing pointing out that the worship we owe to god and the service we owe to god the latria is um, radically distinct from any worship or reverence we give to those who are merely human who are merely creators which is reflected in this term, dulia. So those two terms have kind of throughout a lot of Christian history in churches that um, value art and artistic representations in them, they draw a sharp distinction between those things. That, that um, art leads to dulia if it's about a saint, or it should lead to latria if it's about God. But those shouldn't be confused. Now, at times in history, those things probably have gotten confused. And this leads to some of the other struggles that we've had, which typically gets summarized as the conflict between the iconoclasts and the iconoduels. Duel there at the end of icono means um, a lover or, or value or respecter of icons is what these refers to. And so these initial conflicts showed up in the Greek Orthodox Church where they have a strong presence of icons who were... Um, in some form or fashion, very closely connected with the actual person or being being represented by them. They're, they're more than just a picture in uh, the Orthodox Church. But iconoclasts were people who took the Second Commandment very seriously. They saw blurring of lines between Dulia and Latri Latria. And so iconoclasts means destroyers of icons, people who would go in and uh, burn churches down or rip all the paintings off the walls, those types of things. The icono duels were people who were in favor of icons and keeping them. And so this conflict has kind of been in Christian history for a while. There's several examples in the Byzantine world of these iconoclastic controversies, they're frequently called. But the Reformation gives us another really good example of this conflict between iconoclasts and iconoduels. Many of the reformers were definitely definitely iconoclasts of different varieties. They, um, you know, Luther was not as big against images as someone like Calvin certainly was. Zwingli was definitely an iconoclast um, and wanting to destroy the images because he felt like it, it prevented people from worshiping God purely. So the iconoclasts are typically motivated by a concern for a blurring between Latria and Dulia. That's generally their motivation. They are, they're concerned that in some way, shape, or form, people are, are stealing or, or having reverence given to them that should only be due to God. And they want to, to break those things apart and make it really clear that it's God alone that we worship. The icon of duels, on the other hand, while recognizing the dulia latria distinction, they don't want to blur that line, but they also would say, you know, we are physical beings who are incarnate things, things like smells, images, 
um, temperature, setting, mood, lighting, all of those things impact how we feel and how we approach things. We don't approach God like the angels do. It's just pure spirit. And they would say things like these images, these icons, they, they, um, in many churches, they're designed to, to mirror the idea of the communion of the saints from the uh, like Apostles' Creed. Or when um, in the book of Hebrews, talking about the idea, you know, we run before this great cloud of witnesses there. These saints on the walls of the church were designed to depict that great cloud of witnesses. So when I'm going to church, I'm not just going to church myself or just with my family. All people who have been part of this are all worshiping here and now together. We'll talk about this more when we talk about the cathedral in the, uh, the third talk. But... It's important to understand that when people saw themselves throughout much of Christian history going to church, they saw themselves literally going to heaven. And so they're, they're going from earth to heaven into church where they're joining with the saints who are worshiping forever. This is kind of like our foretaste or our glimpse of the worship that, um, that God and the saints enjoy all the time. We're getting a, a foretaste of that. And the icons were designed to kind of remind us that that's where we're going. This is what we're part of. This is a different place than the rest of the world. We've exited our world and we entered the presence of God in heaven among the saints. And so those conflicts, like I said, if you um, know much of Christian history, you see those things come up again and again. And they are certainly still present um, today, this kind of conflict between where do we put the burden of um, of emphasis when it comes to images. And I'm not going to come down on any particular side in that conflict on this, but it is something that, that we have to acknowledge has been present through a lot of Christian history. Next um, is this idea of truth, goodness, and beauty. Um, I teach at a classical school, and classical schools are typically um, driven by an understanding that this is what we want our children to understand. We want our students to graduate with an understanding of the truth, goodness, and beauty of the world. And I think these things um, tie the Trinity together for us. Now, truth is an objective thing. It's an objective reality. It's rooted, I think, in God the Father. And it's asking us, basically, what are the things that we should know about the world and about ourselves? And it's God the Father who kind of embodies that pure objectiveness. Goodness, goodness is about action, it's about accomplishing things, about ethics and virtue. And of course, there's been no more virtuous person than Christ who came and laid down his life, right, for his enemies. He came to serve, as he tells us, not to be served. But he is the embodiment of goodness in that sense. And then it's the Holy Spirit that calls us to worship. The Holy Spirit calls us to say, this is a good thing that you're doing. Make your worship beautiful and it calls us towards beauty and so i think in those things when we when we see a beautiful work of art and we feel something inside of us that's god's spirit working inside us saying saying this pay attention to this you can see an aspect of my nature in this beauty because i am beautiful i am truth i am goodness and whenever you're looking for those things in other places you're really seeing me you're finding me um, St. Francis of Assisi, um, he used to say to his followers, he'd say, um, you need to teach the faith and sometimes use words. <laughs> one of the things we'll see um, a little bit today, but more next, uh, in the next one, we look at kind of Christian art on a historical overview, is that for many, for most people in history, words have not been their primary means of interacting with the spiritual world because they're not literate. Most people have been illiterate. And so images, pictures have been very, very important um, in those times to convey the faith to others. So if you think about even if you have small children or grandchildren who are little, we oftentimes get them like a picture Bible book where we can talk to them about the faith through looking at these pictures. Okay, here's the garden, here's the snake and the apple. Right? And there's, we can have these images in our mind. Sometimes like I can picture things from my own childhood Bibles that show these things and you can tell a child the story before they're even able to read it. And this is a lot of ways how images have been used. They've been used in the Christian church to teach the gospel, to teach um, 
the faith beyond the gospel, beyond just the like Jesus is Lord, but like then like now what does that mean? And so a lot of the images of saints are designed to be models for people to be like, okay, that's that's how you should live. The sacrifices they made, the way in which they ordered and shaped their life, that should give you insight into how you should order and shape your life. And as you experience these things regularly in a church setting like that, you think you would, you would see that, like, yes, you're hearing the word, but it's the pictures and images that are really going to be speaking to you. Now, when St. Francis said, teach the faith, and sometimes these words, he was really talking about actions, <laughs> that basically let people see your actions as a follower of Christ, and uh, and then, then hopefully they will ask you about it. But I think it applies in art too, though, that artists are trying to basically go, how can we make the gospel real and speak to people where they are? And particularly, you know, um, you know, the, the printing press is invented in the mid 1400s. So prior to that point in time, if you were going to put something down in words, it took a good bit of effort to, to scribe it out. And then you'd have to have some other scribes write it to make multiple copies. Otherwise, you were very dependent upon a situation like this, where like you're dependent upon me saying the words from my mouth, you hearing them in your ears. Now, because we're recording this, people in the future could listen and hear this talk also, and that's a great advantage. But for most of human history, that hasn't been how people have experienced things. So when a painter makes a painting that shows some aspect of the gospel, that's something that, that could be applicable for his generation, but also for generations to come. He's spread, He's sharing beauty and the gospel with all these people coming after him in a way that in the Middle Ages was far more easier to do than through books. Okay, so after that kind of um, introduction, kind of where is, uh, is the art, um, kind of why or is it okay that we do this um, art thing <laughs> as Christians, and we're going to look now at some real common Christian symbols. Some of these are probably going to be super familiar to you, some may not be, um, but just want to get us all on the same page when it comes to thinking about Christian symbols. So this picture here is a, a really common um, medieval icon called the Tree of Life. Um, so when we think about the word tree of life, right, clearly a probably images in Genesis are called to mind. We think about, um, you know, that's why uh, God does not want them to stay in the garden. He says, you know, they, then if they've already eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but then we don't want them to eat from the tree of life and live forever. And Christian theologians um, connected that pretty quick, quickly, particularly when you have a reference to the tree of life again in Revelation, to being, well, the tree of life is really the cross. It's, it's Christ. And his work on the tree is the thing that brings life to everyone. And so here in this imagery, which is typically what it looks like, we have this kind of like, like pouring out from Jesus' cross are like the lives of the saints or the words of the gospel writers are all flowing out from that. You know, as Jesus himself says in John, right, you know, I am the vine and you are the branches, right? Unless you're connected to me, you have no life. So life flows from Christ as the tree out to the world. And they were like, well, where is Jesus connected with the tree? Well, it's at the cross. It's clearly that thing. And so this is a very common imagery in a lot of medieval art, this idea of Jesus um, on the cross, and the cross is a tree of life. So whereas, you know, we might say, whereas with, uh, you know, Joseph, what you meant for evil, Jewish leaders, Romans, and killing me, God meant for good and brought life out of it, and life in abundance. Okay, but let's look at some simple symbols, though, for, um, for Christian symbols. We're going to look at four kind of categories of things, uh, kind of simple symbols that Christians have used um, throughout, um, from many cases, from the very earliest days of the church to establish um, meaning and uh, create a, a sense of bonding maybe in places where there's persecution of like if I draw this symbol and you know what it is it's safe whereas otherwise it might not be so I'm gonna look at the cross uh, depictions of Jesus um, the Holy Spirit and then the church and saints how those things play out okay this here is probably the most common cross that we're all familiar with seeing it's called the Latin cross and it refers to it's it's a lowercase t. It's the type of cross Jesus was probably crucified on. Um, it's a very common cross. We see it on all sorts of uh, church steeples. It uh, gets used a lot um, 
in Protestant circles um, a lot as opposed to a crucifix, which we'll look at here in a little bit. Um, generally speaking, the difference though between an empty cross, like a Latin cross like this, or a crucifix, um, is, is a difference in, in emphasis between Catholics and Protestants, typically. Um, whereas Catholics with the cru crucifix are typically saying it's, it's a, the cross in and of itself is irrelevant. It's the cross that Jesus died on. That's the cross that really matters. It's his sacrifice on Good Friday that really matters, not just the cross generically. Whereas Protestants, when they do kind of an empty cross like this, typically are we're talking about the idea that, that Christ rose from the dead. The cross is not the end of things, and the cross that brought um, death to Jesus brings life to us as we participate in the resurrection life of Christ. Another very common type of cross is a Greek cross cross, which looks just like a plus sign for us, um, is how we might think of it. Many, many churches in the Middle Ages are built on one of these two floor plans even. So if you've ever been to a place like Notre Dame, Notre Dame is a great example of a Latin cross church. Uh, Westminster Abbey in London is a great example of a Latin cross church. It's got a really long nave, the altar is way up at the front, the, the, you, get, you can stand in the middle and kind of see the cross sections going on there, that type of thing. Other Latin cross churches would be places like um, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is a Latin cross church. The Duomo in Florence is a Latin cross church. Um, it's a very common um, way of building a church. So again, if you remember, a church is basically like coming into heaven. Well, how do we enter into heaven? We can only enter into heaven as sinners through the grace of Christ, one on the cross. So therefore, everything about the building even needs to be cross-centric. Um, the Greek cross is, is also another way of building churches, and it's a smaller kind of plus sign. St. Peter's Basilica in Rome was originally designed to be a Greek cross, and later on in its development, they decided to extend the, the front um, section out to make it into a Latin cross. But um, you see these types of symbols everywhere. Um, there's just a distinction between the two, and typically it's a cultural distinction between kind of East and West. Another kind of famous type of cross you'll see is what's called the Celtic cross. So the Celtic cross has all this fancy weaving work done into it, which was a Celtic symbol prior to uh, Christianity. And so this is kind of showing that Christianity is coming in and, and bringing um, the beauty of the old things that were there before it and melding them into the Christian um, cycle. The Celtic cross also very frequently has a circle connected around it, which is about the idea of God being an infinite being, right? A circle is an infinite thing, and so the, the circle is there to be a reminder of the infinity of God. We can never, we can never outdo God or get beyond God. Another um, popular cross you see sometimes, my wife has a necklace with one of these on it, it's called the Jerusalem Cross. This was, uh, became real popular with the Crusaders. Uh, it's, it's the Greek cross, as you can see, with little plus, uh, lines on the end, and then four smaller Greek crosses in the corners. This was a sign that Crusaders would wear as a sign of their uh, pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Um, and in, in identifying themselves as Christians and where they were going. They were going to uh, to Jerusalem. Another cross you see sometimes was called the Tau cross. It looks like the Greek letter Tau, which is their T in Greek. Um, this cross is the symbol of the Franciscan order today. They wear it everywhere in, in their things. Um, but some, people, some scholars think that the cross that Jesus was crucified on was not really a Latin cross with the the cross beam down here, but looked more like a T with the cross beam up at the top. And the Tau cross takes its inspiration from that type of, of, uh, of idea. Then we have the St. Andrew's cross. Um, it's most famous as the, being part of the flag of Scotland. If you've seen the flag of Scotland, St. Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland. Um, it's a cross on an X, which is how, according to tradition, St. Andrew was crucified. So other you know, famous figures in, biblically who were crucified were St. Peter, who was crucified on a Latin cross, but upside down. So if you're ever looking at imagery and somebody's upside down on a cross, it's probably Peter is a good bet. Um, but a St. Andrew cross is an X cross, um, and that's how uh, St. Andrew was crucified according to tradition. And so you'll see those X's uh, that's referring to St. Andrew. 
Then we have the crucifix, very common in, again, Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican uh, churches, um, Jesus on the cross. So here we have Jesus on the cross. We've got the wounds we can see there. Um, we have the halo behind him. Um, halos for Jesus always have, let's say always, almost always have a cross inside of them to make it really obvious that this is Jesus we're talking about. He's the one with the cross. And if you can see at the very top, you have this I-N-R-I. -I. Um, you see this in a lot of paintings of the crucifixions and this type of thing. And this is a shorthand way of saying the, the bit that Pilate had nailed to the cross above Jesus to talk about who he was who was being crucified. And so it's the first letters from the four words, Jesus Nazareth Rex Judea, right? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, which is what Pilate had written down. Of course, the Jewish leaders are like, hey, 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 he, he's not our king. Don't, don't say that. Take that down. And Pilate's like, I've written what I've written. Leave it be. Of course, you know, Pilate didn't know how right he was in that sense. But anytime you see that I-N-R-I, -I, that, that's what that's referring to. It's the Latin for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, Rex, Judea, Jesus, Nazareth. So here we have a famous depiction of Jesus. So this is from the Hagia Sophia in um, Istanbul, or Constantinople, built back in the 500s by the Emperor Justinian, one of the great Byzantine emperors. And there's a couple of things I just want to note about uh, this picture. Um, so note one, the gold background. A lot of icons, if you're familiar with iconography at all, have gold backgrounds. Um, a lot of churches had gold um, behind the saints. And the point of that was to make it like heaven. Gold is a symbol of heaven. And so the idea is that this, um, this being is in the heavenly realm with God. He's in the, the beautiful place with God. And it's to separate it from our world. They know they're not trying to make um, people look real when they're making these icons. They're, um, but they're placing them in this, this other place, but that, that is an other place that's part of our world too because we're able to enter in to the church. Um, you see at the top there the IC and the XC. Um, in Greek at the time, the way this was written, those are the first and last letters of Jesus Christos. Okay? The C is a final S sound in Greek at the time. The I is what we would call a J, and the X is the chi, the beginning of the word Christos. So Jesus Christ, Christos. Notice also, again, we have the halo for Jesus with the cross behind it to make it really clear to us who this is. So again, this is all identifying who this person is for the parishioners coming in who may not be able to read or understand, but they can look at this and be like, that is Jesus. Last thing I'd like to call your attention to here on this is to Jesus' hands. You'll see um, Jesus will frequently have his hands in a pose like this, with these fingers like this type of thing, right, as he is doing here. What this is, is he's symbolizing a couple things. One, there's, there's, he's doing what's called the Cairo, which is the, uh, the famous symbol of early Christians. We'll see here in a second. He's making a Cairo out of his fingers, and then the row is his arm here, which looks like a P to us. But he's also saying something about theology, right? We said at the beginning, right? Jesus is fully God and fully man. So the two fingers at the top together are reminding us of the dual nature of Jesus. He's fully God and fully man. And the three fingers connected down at the bottom are reminding us of the Trinity, right? God is one and three Jesus is fully God and fully man, all appearing in this one kind of hand gesture that's being provided for the people there. And of course, he's holding the book of life, right? Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's holding the book of life with the seals there. This has been broken down because the Hagia Sophia has been a mosque at different times. I think recently the Turkish government just decided to turn it back into a mosque. Damage has been done to the icons that were in there. But um, that's what he's holding there because he is the, the author of life. So I mentioned the Cairo earlier there in his fingers. This is the Cairo symbol. It takes the two Greek letters, Chi and Rho, which are the first two letters of Christos, and just combines them together. Chi in the Greek alphabet is, looks like what we would call an X, and the Rho looks like a P. It gets confusing sometimes if you're learning Greek because the P will not be a P. It's an R sound. But... Uh, 
these put together like this was a very early symbol of Christianity because it just took the beginning of that idea of Christ. You could make it real simply and people could understand it or not understand it as you could kind of find out if people you're around are Christians or not. Another very early symbol for Jesus is the fish. Um, fish in Greek is the word ichthus, and the fish became connected with Jesus because it takes the first letters of the phrase at the bottom there and makes it out into ichthus. So what this is in Greek is Jesus Christus, Theu Huios Soter. Right? So Jesus Christ, Theo, God, so we get theology from, Huios is son, so God's son, and Soter means savior. So in the fish symbol, all of these things were put in there. Jesus Christ, right? In Christ, we're talking about the Messiah, the, the, uh, the one of Israel that's coming to redeem things is there, right? So Jesus Christus, God's son, the savior. All of that is being communicated by the fish symbol. So when people put fishes on the back of their cars today, that's what they're saying is this same thing. And this has been a symbol of Christianity for almost 2,000 years now, one of the very first symbols of uh, the Christian church. Another early symbol of the Christian church is what's called the Agnus Dei, or the Lamb of God, right, depicted in a wide variety of ways. We'll look at some specific examples more next week of Agnus Dei. But here we have the Lamb of God. Notice the halo, right? Halo has the cross in it, so we know we're talking about Jesus. Still, it's very explicit. But the Lamb of God on top of the Book of Life. Those are the seven seals of the Book of Life from Revelation, where John talked about seeing a Lamb come to, um, and who is able to open the seals of the Book of Life that no one else can open because of what he's done. Then we have the Holy Spirit. But you all think in your minds right now what the symbol of the Holy Spirit is. You probably all can see it already. This is one we're probably all familiar with. But the Holy Spirit is the dove. So if you're seeing doves in, in art are typically connected with peace if they're generic or they're connected with the Holy Spirit if it's a religious work. Um, this is from St. Peter's Basilica, um, this, uh, this depiction of the Holy Spirit here in Rome. So now when we turn to the church and the, some of the, the saints of the church, um, there's a couple ones that are really important to, to know. The first is St. Peter, right? uh, the great apostle. Um, Peter is almost always depicted in art with keys. Right? So remember in Matthew, I don't remember the passage, 15 maybe, Pete, Jesus says, you know, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and, and what's you, what you lock up on earth will be bound on earth, and what you are will be bound in heaven, and what you loose will be loosed in heaven, right? So Peter is always depicted holding keys as a symbol of that. So if you're looking at a, at a painting at some, or a sculpture like this here, and they're holding keys, it's Peter. And in the papal insignia, notice you see the crossed keys there. It's a reminder that from the papal perspective, they see themselves as the continuation of Peter's ministry. They are the, uh, the, the heirs to Peter's holding of the keys, and that's crucial to their identity of who they are, is this idea of the keys of the kingdom. Um, St. Matthew, uh, the gospel writer, is oftentimes depicted as a, uh, a man, or with a man in the background, is what we have here, oftentimes a divine man. All of the four gospel writers have images that go with them uh, that's important and kind of just are connected with them. And these passages come from um, Ezekiel 1 and then Revelation uh, 4. Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4 is where these images come from. You may read those here in a second. Um, you'll kind of get an idea. I'll definitely read the Revelation passage. But Matthew is depicted as a divine figure. He's being inspired by the, the divine man coming there, as we see in this picture here. Mark is typically depicted as a lion. Okay. So this is from the Basilica of St. Mark in Venice. Up on the very top of it, we have this um, lion imagery, this winged lion. So that's St. Mark's image. St. Luke is uh, depicted as a winged ox. And St. John is depicted with an eagle. 
So a winged ox and an eagle. So I'm going to read uh, Revelation 4, 6 to 8, and you'll kind of get a picture of these types of things going on here. So it says, Surrounding this throne were 24 other thrones. This is the throne that uh, the Lord of glory is seated upon, the Ancient of Days, upon which were seated 24 elders. They were clothed in white garments and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and peals of thunder. Before it burned seven flaming torches, the seven spirits of God. The floor around the throne was like a sea of glass that was crystal, crystal clear. At the very center, around the throne itself, stood four living creatures covered with eyes front and back. The first creature resembled a lion, the second an ox, the third had the face of a man, while the fourth looked like an eagle. Okay. So early Christians, as they started thinking about the, uh, the gospel writers, they connected the gospel writers with these four creatures, because they're basically the, 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 how is the, the message going out into the world? How is the gospel going out? Well, it's going out through the works that they've done. Um, St. Irenaeus, who lived, uh, he died in the very early 200s, so a very early Christian. He developed this idea there, um, connecting these things to, with these images from Revelation, and there's also the similar images back in Ezekiel 1, connecting those images with the particular gospel writers. So he reflects a very, very ancient tradition. And the idea behind these is that Matthew is, is embodies humanity. Um, you know, it's a very human gospel. It seeks to present, it starts with his family lineage, right? It goes back to being a son of Abraham, son of David. He kind of roots him in his humanness and is particularly interested in kind of him being the Messiah of the Old Testament people. Um, Mark, is uh, you know, begins his gospel with the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And the, um, the lion is oftentimes connected with the idea of prophecy or the spirit of prophecy going on. And there's also a royal aspect, obviously, connected with the lion that is certainly appropriate for one such as the Son of God. With the winged ox in Luke, this is meant to, some, to symbolize sacrifice. Um, Luke is the one that we get the story of the, the prodigal son, for example, that ends with the sacrifice of the fatted calf. And it's to remind us of the priestly character of Jesus who is coming to be the sacrifice himself. And then John is the eagle, you know, where the eagles, or eagles soar into heaven, right? And John's gospel is typically regarded as the most um, theologically profound. St. Augustine said that... Um, it's it's easy and it's it's shallow enough that a young child can play in it and not and not drown themselves. But it's also deep enough that an elephant can wade into it and not reach the bottom. I paraphrase that he may not have said exactly like that. He said something very close to that. But the idea is that basically, you know, John's gospel begins right in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? This this beautiful depiction of the divinity of Christ that in the whole thing is just calling us towards um, heaven. We've got the, you know, the beautiful uh, I am section. You know, I am the door. I am the vine. We have the beautiful priestly, high priestly prayer in John 17 for his people. Right? The Gospel of John just aches with this kind of um, beautiful language calling us higher. And so that's why the eagle represents St. John. So you will oftentimes in depictions of the gospel writers see them with their kind of spirit creature coming from revelation there standing before the throne all right more briefly now i want to look at uh, colors and how colors show up in pictures we've already seen some colors um, i want to talk about four main colors that you see a lot in religious christian art and kind of what they mean typically the so first is white so this is a painting of uh, saint thomas aquinas and to notice the white habit on him the white linen on jesus i'm sure you can probably think about what white means Give you a second to think about it. Okay. Right, white means purity. Okay. So in the Dominican habit, which St. Thomas is depicted wearing because he was a Dominican, their habit is black and white. The black is sin, it reminds them of death and sin. The white reminds them of the purity that they have in Christ. And so white is, almost always symbolizes purity in a religious painting. So if it's someone who's a virgin martyr, they're oftentimes depicted in white. Um, colors. Blue. Blue is the heavenly color. 
And blue is also very, very closely connected with Mary. If you're looking at a work of Christian art and there's a woman who's clothed in blue in it, it's 99.9 .9 times out of 100, it's Mary, even if it's not telling you this. This here is also from the Hagia Sophia. Um, so we've got this telling us this is Mary, him, him Ro, and Theu, God, here. Oops, didn't want to go there yet. Um, so notice again, we've got the two halos. You can tell which one Jesus is, right? Because he's got the cross in there. But blue, it can also be a symbol of royalty, but it's typically a symbol of heaven. Someone who has kind of made it into heaven and is part of um, that, that world. And Mary is seen as intercessing with Christ on our behalf in the heavenly places. But Mary and blue are very, very closely connected. And you may notice if you look really closely at Jesus' right hand, what symbol he's making again there. It's that same symbol we saw earlier. This here is called The Holy Family by Michelangelo. It's one of the only small things he ever painted. He tended, he hated painting, generally speaking, and really hated frescoing. Um, but those are the paintings he's most famous for, obviously, in the Sistine Chapel. But this is called The Holy Family. It's a depiction of Mary, uh, Joseph, and Jesus. Okay? Notice in Mary, we have two main colors predominating here. We have this reddish pink color, and then the blue that always goes with Mary. Um, the reddish color is typically a symbol of martyrdom. If a, if, a, if a religious person is depicted in red, it's normally a sign that they've been martyred for the faith. And um, in Luke's gospel, we're told that uh, at the presentation of Jesus at the temple, um, one of the people that they presented to tells Mary that a, soul, a sword shall pierce your soul also in light of all the things that Jesus is going to do. And so she's sometimes depicted in red as a symbol of the suffering she went through, watching her son grow up to be the Messiah, um, etc. So that's what's going on um, here in this picture. This is such an interesting picture to me in all sorts of ways. And, and the, the, the background is the pagan world that didn't realize that the Messiah had come, that God himself had come in the flesh in front of them. They're busy living their own lives and this kind of um, innocence in front, behind the Holy Family. But it's such an interesting painting in that this is about the most awkward way possible you could transfer a baby from one adult to another. <laughs> I'm not sure why Michelangelo wanted to do that, except for the fact that like I said, Michelangelo was not a, uh, not a painter. He always saw himself as a sculptor. As a sculptor, he's really interested in movements of bodies and how that plays out. And so I think that's what's going on here is he's giving Mary this kind of awkward pose as a means of kind of seeing how her body's moving with that. He's very interested in body contortions, which we'll see more of that here in just a little bit. Here's another example of the red in place. So this is St. Sebastian. Um, St. Sebastian was a... Uh, a very, very popular saint in the Middle Ages who was uh, reputed to be a Roman soldier uh, towards the end of the empire who uh, basically decided he couldn't continue to be a soldier. He needed to um, devote himself entirely to Christ, and the Romans shot him with arrows to kill him. Um, so anytime you see a saint holding arrows or with arrows in his body, it's St. Sebastian. If you go to the Louvre, there's like 50 different versions of St. Sebastian in the Louvre because he was just a really popular saint in the Middle Ages because he's somebody who went kind of the full measure of devotion was the idea um, behind his sacrifice and something that particularly in the Middle Ages and for a warrior class was a reminder of kind of who their ultimate loyalty should be. So here he is holding the arrows that killed him garbed in the robe of martyrdom, the red robe. Okay, so now we're going to, um, the last few minutes we have here, we've got just a couple minutes left here, we're going to look at some famous pieces of Christian art and kind of talk about how to read them here. So this here is Caravaggio's, um, you can probably, um, may be familiar with this, you can certainly think of the biblical imagery here, if you've got a man all in white, or what white symbolizes, it symbolizes purity, all right, holding back his cloak, another man pushing his finger into a hole in his side, right? This is Doubting Thomas, you know, coming to Jesus. Jesus is in white because he's pure. This is after the resurrection. He's, he has no stain of sin or death on him anymore. He is pure, and he's, um, Thomas is inserting his finger into the wound in the side, like he said he needed to do in order to believe that he really raised from the dead. But let's look at some other art. I apologize for this not being a fantastic picture, but this is a really, really old <laughs> piece of art. 
this um, this piece of art goes back to uh, the the third century, so the two hundreds. Um, it was carved in a Roman catacomb um, outside of the walls of Rome today. And it's, it's one of the very earliest depictions of Jesus that we have. So I don't know if you can see it really well. Like I said, it's just, it's not in great shape because it's 1,800 years old. I think we can give it maybe a little bit of a grace for that. But it's Jesus. He's carrying a bucket of water, which think about what water might symbolize in the Christian tradition. And he's holding... Um, a lamb or a shepherd, a sheep across his back. It's not exactly sure what it is. It might be a calf um, or it might be a sheep. But the idea of this is this is Jesus as the good shepherd, right? That's one of the images of Jesus that's being done. He's the good shepherd. The water, of course, is baptism, right? That's what he does. He brings his people to water, to, to a land flowing with milk and honey where they can have all the good things. But he goes after the lost and brings them back. He carries them back. And this is one of the earliest depictions we have of Jesus. So here's another very early um, interesting depiction of Jesus. Please notice the hands. Again, it's the same, same thing again there. This painting um, is done on a piece of wood. It's in a monastery in Egypt today. It was painted sometime during the 6th century, so the 500s AD, and it's, uh, it's, it's called the Pantocrator the Pantocrator, which um, in Greek means the one who has authority over all things, right? So think about, you know, in Revelation, Jesus is, you know, there's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? That's this idea of Pantocrator. Um, and so this is a very, very old depiction of Jesus. Um, if you look at his face very closely, you'll notice that there's kind of two sides to it. Like the left side, as you're looking at it, looks somewhat different than the right side. We're not exactly sure why that is, but most scholars think that the off the painter was trying to depict the dual natures of Jesus, that he's fully God and fully man, is trying to show that in his work of art that he's putting together here. Notice also Jesus is carrying the book of life again, because that's what he is, the holder of, and the one who gives that. Um, this here, um, I'll give you a second to look at it, and you can see kind of what... Um, what if you can see what picture this is or what story this is from the, the Gospels. See what you maybe see. Okay, so this is the Annunciation. Uh, this is the angel appearing to Mary to tell her that she is going to bear the Son of God, the Messiah. So this is Mary over here in our bottom left. Notice she's got the red and the blue, the same two colors. It's from Michelangelo's Holy Family going on there. We have the Holy Spirit descending from heaven upon her, just like the angel tells her will happen. Um, gold there around the angel. Gold is frequently another symbol of heaven or royalty. And you know, the, um, the angel says he's one who you know, stands in the presence of God, basically. And so it has this kind of connotation of glory that the gold is meant to represent. So um, he had the spirit descending as a dove, as we hear about frequently in scripture, connected with you know, the baptism of Jesus. Here's another depiction of the same thing. So this is uh, Botticelli's version of the Annunciation. So again, we have um, Mary here on the right. Um, notice the colors again. She's got the blue, she's got the red again. Um, we have the angel depicting itself, you know, arriving here going on with you know, saying this is the, what's happening here in Mary. This is her response, where she's basically saying, let it be, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me as you would, as we have the, the colors there. And then in the background, right, notice we have this big tree jumping out to us in the back, right? This is meant to remind us, obviously, again, of the tree of life, right? This is pointing ahead to the crucifixion that's coming. And that the idea that this is supposed to change the world, that's what's behind this, right? It's going out from this very localized, very specific thing happening to this young Jewish woman, and then it's going to go out into the world and spread. Anybody remember who this guy is? I think we just talked about him. He's a martyr. He's got some arrows with him. <laughs> this is a, a very famous depiction by a guy named Montaigne of uh, St. Um, St. Stephen. Okay. St. Stephen, as I said earlier. St. Sebastian, sorry, getting my S saints confused. St. Sebastian. 
Um, this is in the Louvre, this painting here. Again, this, this type of depiction was very popular. There are some that are less graphically bloody that might just have like a single arrow in him. Um, he looks much more angelic, but uh, this is designed to depict again the, uh, the sacrifice he's making. But if you look at the world around St. Sebastian here, right, it's this idea that kind of the classical world is crumbling around him. Right, he was he was for the future, you might say, like the men who are walking away in the back. They're going away from the classical world. Saint Sebastian is kind of that person being at the end of the Roman Empire. He's persecuted for being a Christian, but the Roman Empire is crumbling while this is happening, and the future is what's going on in the background towards towards life. That's that's where it really is. But he stands as a martyr to the cause of Christ. All right, now we're going to look at two more complicated paintings. This will be the, the end here. So this is in the Vatican. Um, it's called The Disputation Concerning the Sacrament by Raphael. It's right opposite a uh, probably more famous painting of his called The School of Athens. But in this painting, I think I want you to see kind of all of the imagery we've just been looking at all kind of coming together here. So what's going on here is we have two layers of things. We've got at the bottom is Earth. And then where the clouds are and up is the heavenly realms. So they're, they're, but they're happening at the same time is the idea. And so you look, as you look at it, see if you can find Mary. Remember what her cue is, right? All right, so Mary's in blue and she's seated right next to Jesus there in the middle. Right, Jesus is in white, right, because he's pure. He's the pure lamb of God, right? Um, notice you can see in his halo a little bit of the cross going on there. Um, now, think about, so we haven't talked about this figure because I think it's pretty obvious, but if you look to our right as we're looking at Jesus, who is that right to Jesus' right? Who do you think that might be? Jesus is left, our right, sorry, as we're looking at it. So notice what he's doing. He's pointing to Jesus. So if you think about in Scripture, who's the person who comes to point the way to Jesus? It's John the Baptist. John the Baptist is almost always in art depicted either pointing up. There's a famous Da Vinci painting where he's pointing up as a sign of him pointing away from himself. Because John's whole point is it's not about me, it's about Jesus. And so we almost always see um, John near Jesus pointing towards him. He's oftentimes also depicted in rough clothing that he's wearing as well for his things. Um, we have the Trinity going down the middle. If you can see that, so we found Jesus right there. Right below Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, right, the dove descending. And then that's God the Father up at the top. Notice he's holding the world in his hand. And look at, and if you can see it, this is not super clear, but look at the hand gesture that God the Father has. We've seen that before. It's that same hand gesture of the Trinity and the dual natures of things happening up there. That, that is reminding us of who Jesus is. He is fully God with us. Now, if we look at where the, um, uh, the Spirit is, notice we've got four uh, angels carrying books. What do you think those four books might be? Is that any four books that might be relevant here? So right across, right below Jesus' feet, where the Holy Spirit is, right? These are the Gospels. This is, again, how do we enter heaven? We enter heaven through the intercessory work of the Spirit, renewing us through the hearing of Scripture. That's how we find out about Jesus. That's how we move into heaven. A couple other uh, characters to look at here. So f take, find the Holy Spirit and go all the way off to our left. There's a figure over there in blue and gold. See if you can see what he's holding in his hand, in his right hand. You see that? And this is the best picture I can get. I may actually could zoom in a little bit more at some point. But those are the keys. He's holding keys. So that's Peter. Right? He's sitting right next to a naked man. Who might that be? Think about any naked men in Scripture. This is Adam. Right, this is Adam being brought into and renewed up in heaven. Right? Then we've got some other saints up there. Now let's switch to the other side of the painting. Our right, Jesus is left. 
At the far right, opposite Peter, we have the other of the greatest apostles, right? The apostle who was born late. He's holding a book because he wrote a lot of things, and he's holding a sword. That's a real common imagery for this, this saint. This is St. Paul. And the far right, he's got kind of a bluish purple cloak and a red cape of some kind around him. Red because he was martyred. Okay? And then if you go down a little bit from Paul to the guy in blue, who's got little like radiating things coming out of him, you notice he's holding some tablets. What, what figure do you think might be holding tablets who's in heaven? Right? This is Moses. Right? So all these things are being depicted here. And so again, notice there's this, this thing on earth that's happening where they're, they're having concerns about who um, the sacrament, what's happening there. But the point is that earth and heaven are so closely connected here. We can't see heaven, but it's right there. It's right there for us um, to, to reach out and grasp with faith is the, is the idea that's kind of being presented here by this disputation. Okay, last one, most complicated piece to look at yet. This is the Last Judgment by Michelangelo. So this is in the Sistine Chapel. He painted this about 25 years after he painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling. That's right above it. But if you just look at it, obviously it's chaotic. There's lots and lots of crazy things going on here. But as you look at it, let's start with Mary. See if you can find Mary. She, she pops out on the, on the screen. I remember that her key, her key feature in, in religious art is that she wears blue. And she wears blue. And so there she is there in the middle right next to Jesus. Who notice that Jesus is much, much larger than Mary. Right? Jesus is the center of things and everything is kind of revolving around him. Maybe next week we can look at this in more in depth. But since we're just looking at how do we interpret and read art, I just want to point out a couple things. Then we're going to zoom in and look at the center section around Jesus. But if you look at the very top left as we're looking at it and top right, the angels are bringing in the things of Christ's death. Right? We have the cross up there. We have angels carrying the crown of thorns down. We have the pillar in the top right where um, uh, Jesus was, was lashed. Right, tied to be lashed. So the, the, the things that brought about the, the death of Christ are kind of being brought here as kind of signs of his victory and triumph here at the end of all things, of the last judgment over death. It's because of his sacrifice through these things that the judgment is able to happen and people are able to be saved. Now across the middle there in, in where Jesus is and Mary across there, these are, these are the saints. These are the ones being saved. Many of them are depicted with the, the ways in which they were martyred. Um, so you'll see crosses in there and that type of thing. But I want to zoom in a little bit, and then the damned are down at the very bottom, if you want to keep going down. The, in the middle, right below Jesus' feet, those are the angels, uh, the trumpets playing to awaken the dead. So you've got the dead rising on the left, the damned descending on the right to hell. But now we're going to zoom in a little bit and look at the coll collection of figures right around Jesus and read these a little bit. Right. So now we're in a little bit tighter here. So we've got a couple figure things going on here. So notice, um, so if we start with Jesus and move off to the left from Jesus, kind of just follow his elbow over here. We've got a man with a white beard. You might see the guy with the white beard. He's got something in his left hand that he's holding back. It's a little bit hard to see what that is, but that's a key. This is Peter. All right, and what Peter is doing is he's returning the key to Jesus. Basically, like now that the judgment has come, he doesn't need to be the one who holds on to the keys anymore. There's no keys to separate um, earth and heaven anymore because they're, they're joining together. And so the keys are being given back to Christ there. And as we... Um, Come down, if, we, if you find Mary here and then drop down below her, we've got this guy who's holding what looks like a ladder. If I see the guy with the ladder. That's St. Lawrence. He, um, by tradition, was grilled alive. And so that's him holding his grill that was used to, uh, to, kill, to kill him there as a kind of a reminder of the sacrifice that he went through. Um, if we go to the our right, away from St. Um, 
forgot his name that fast. Wow. Uh, St. Lawrence. We get over to a guy, uh, the next one over, who's holding, looks like a skin suit there. This is St. Bartholomew, who, again, tradition says, was skinned alive for his faith. And so he's holding his skin there. And the, so the saints are kind of bringing, we might say, to Christ the, um, the sacrifices that they've made on his behalf is kind of what's happening here. Um, other characters in here, there's a lot of characters in here that we don't know who they are. Michelangelo didn't live, give, give us a kind of cast of characters or anything. The other characters that we think are present here, like I said, Peter's pretty obvious. He's got the keys, and it's always another one. Mary's really obvious. Over here to the left, we follow Mary and go um, left beyond. Uh, there's three naked bodies there, one that's got its back to us and then one facing us. Um, the two that are facing us are probably Adam and Eve. Um, now, the one on the left would be Eve. She's a very masculine woman, <laughs> but that's a pretty common theme in a lot of Michelangelo's art. If you look at his um, oracles in the Sistine Chapel, which are female, uh, they're typically quite masculine. Um, it's just a thing that he does, but it's probably Adam and Eve being depicted there, um, being present in the, in the heavenly places. Um, the guy with the cross, the one that we can't see his face, but he's walking away from us with the cross there, um, is probably the thief on the cross from Jesus' crucifixion. The one he says, you this day will be with me in paradise. That's probably who that is bringing his cross into, um, into heaven. There's a whole bunch of other kind of saints going on here. The guy behind Peter, if you go back and find Peter, that's Paul again being depicted there. But lots of imagery going on here, but, but he's giving us clues about how we can read and understand this, um, this work of art. Okay, um, that's all I've got for today on kind of art. So hopefully you have an idea of maybe some things to be looking for the next time you go um, to look for art. And so I think we're now time, if we have time for questions, I think we're maybe a little on the long side. I know I got started late, so I'm not sure um, how we're doing with that. I'll leave that up to, to Dan. <laughs> on that. Um, I lost track of, of time with how we're doing here. So um, if you have any, any questions for now about this, or we can certainly handle more next time. Um, next time we're going to look at kind of how art, Christian art changed through history and how we can see the same themes, but played out through um, different artistic expressions. You know, the Renaissance looks different than the Baroque, which looks different than the Middle Ages, which looks different than modern art. But Christians using the creative gifts that have been given to them to depict the same types of things through time. That'll be the, the center of our, our next talk. Josh, as far as I'm concerned, we got three more hours. I, this is the most fascinating thing I've seen. But I do, I do have, I won't, we won't take three hours. But I do want to ask you one question. Uh, the first, when you first started on the Christian symbols, you showed the, the tree of life. Yep. Can, can you tell us where that is, that is located? Um, it's, it's a relatively common painting. I'm trying to think where that one is. Um, Okay. Uh, the most famous one I'm aware of is in, uh, which is not that one, but the most famous example of the Tree of Life is in the Santa Croce Church in Florence. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a, it's this huge thing. It was over an altar at one point in time, but they now keep it in that church, and it's, uh, they try to protect it from flooding because it's had some damage done to it, and the river has flooded in uh, Florence over time. But um, it was in the Middle Ages. It was a relatively common thing to paint for altar pieces to remind people that that christ is the the root of life okay. other questions uh josh i should want to say that uh, i think the the second amendment uh, you know the second commandment was uh, quite enlightening uh, enlightening to me and i really appreciate your 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 speaking upon that well thank you Others? Okay. Um, let's see. I I had one last screen. Let me. Let me. I can put it up. Uh, wait a minute. I I think. Oh, is it because I'm the host now? Yeah. You, can you show us that last screen? Yep. I'll pull it back up here. There we go. Yeah. 
I just wanted to uh, just thank you all and uh, um, I, I'm not sure I've got a, I've got something up here just a second. Uh, we will these this will be recorded and I can tell you Josh I'm going to be watching it for another uh, one or two more times because there's so much in there that I didn't know about and that I just fascinated with and uh, we'll have this uh, I'll have it edited uh, this week and we'll get it in and I, I'm sure uh, by the first by next Monday that'll be uh, on the uh, worship place website and you just go into resources and you click archive media and you'll find them. Uh, the, uh, the, the remainder of our, you, you're talking about next week, Josh, but really I think that uh, we're really going to go about a month apart on these. Next, uh, next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have, we'll have the next one on uh, Christian art through history. And uh, then we'll, we'll follow out on in October on the, on the next one. And then we'll finish up in November. Um, I just wanted to make a couple other comments and I'm going to, I'm going to send this to you if you have it. Uh, there are several people that are watching this from uh, the former church we were in in Waco. And in that church, there's a, a cross tapestry that's there. That's about eight feet wide and 30 feet high that has uh, a lot of different cross symbols on it and has, and there's some, we put together a, uh, uh, a handbook about that or, or a brochure about it that describes them all. And I'll be happy to send a PDF of that out. And uh, the other thing I was thinking is that uh, uh, I would, I think many of you might would, would like to have copies of some of this, these slides. I can't email this copy. You can't believe how big the, 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 pa the package is, but uh, I could, I could ask the, uh, the worship place if they would, print some copies uh, and put six pictures to a slide or something like that in, uh, to a page and, and print those. And uh, if you want them, you could go by and you could pick them up from that. So we'll, we'll like, work, let some of that work out. Uh, and uh, let me uh, get me back up here. I um, think that uh, um, we're, uh, uh, just remind you to be sure and register again for the next one. Uh, you have, you're not registered for each one, uh, for all of them right now. You're registered for the first one, so you'll need to register for each one. Any other questions or comments? Josh, thank you so much. This was just excellent. excellent. I, I'm, just, I'm just astonished by it, and, and we really appreciate it. And we will uh, hope, look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, well, thank you. I really enjoyed this. All right. Do you see the leave the meeting on the bottom?